Scientific fact. Human beings can't live without food. They can't live without water. And they can't live without hope. As you make the journey of life, are you hopeful? If so, what is the source of your hope? Who or what is your hope? One of the most impactful books I've ever read, I think it was an eighth grade reading assignment. We had to read Dr. Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl wrote the book in 1946, not long after he had been liberated from Auschwitz. And the basic premise of the book was this, that those who most were physically strong and able-bodied, those were not the ones necessarily that survived the concentration camp in its horrors. No, the people that survived, according to Frankel, were those who never gave up hope. Christians should be the most hopeful people in all the world. As we jump back into our Romans series this morning, we might ask the question, well, why should we be so hopeful? And we're going to see how the Apostle Paul answers that question by taking us into one of the most hope-filled texts in all of the Bible. So I invite you to turn with me and keep your Bibles open to Romans chapter 15 as we take a look this morning at verses 8 through 13. But let's pray before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now hear God's word addressed to you and me this morning, beginning to read verse 8 of Romans chapter 15. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Arnold Palmer once addressed the National Association of Blind Golfers. These are golfers, men and women, who play golf. They're pretty good at it, too. They learn to hear the pinging sound at the pin and drive their golf balls across the course. Well, after Palmer finished his address, the president of the association challenged Palmer to play their best golfer with a prize of $10,000. But Palmer immediately balked and said, I I can't do that. That would be unfair for a sighted person to play a blind person in golf. So no, I can't do it. Well, then the president said, Arnold, all the money, the $10,000 is going to go to charity. So Palmer reluctantly agreed to play their best blind golfer. He said, when is tea time? And the president of the association said, midnight. (laughs) When the night is dark, what does hope look like? Well, it looks like an 11-year-old boy named, an 11-year-old Italian boy named uh, Italo Rizzenti, who was the innocent victim of a grenade explosion in World War II. It blinded him, blew both of his arms off. But you know what he did? That little 11-year-old boy began to learn Braille, began to learn to read Braille 
with his tongue. And then he said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a musician. I'll probably play the flute. My tongue is very useful. That's what hope looks like, my friends, when the night is darkest. Well, in verse 8 of our text before us this morning, the Apostle Paul tells the early Roman Christians and the 21st century San Antonio Christians that you and I, we have all the hope in the world because of who Jesus Christ is and because of what he's done for us, particularly by taking the form of a servant. Now, you hear me oftentimes say there are only two world religions. There's the gospel of grace, and there's everything else. And part of that gospel of grace, my friends, is the reality that Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, actually entered into time and space, took on human flesh, and became a servant in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I defy you. I defy you to explore any other world religion and check out their gods and find one, even one, that has ever come to humanity in the form of a servant. Ask your Muslim friends, would Allah ever come and be a servant to human beings? They would say, no, 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 no. He is the great potentate. He would never stoop that love. Even the Jews back in Paul's day, even though they were looking for a coming Messiah, were looking for the proverbial conquering king on the white stallion. They were not looking for the Messiah to be a servant, even though there are plenty of servanthood messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. If you could go back to the first century and talk to a Roman pagan who had come to Christ and ask him or her, your former gods, Zeus, Venus, Mars, would any of them ever come and serve humanity? They would say, no, no, no. They would never lower themselves to even associate with humanity, let alone serve human beings. No, my friends, it's Jesus, Jesus alone, who comes as servant. And he does so to serve you and me by doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that's restore us into right relationship with God and with each other and with the surrounding creation. And he did that through his once-for-all sufficient, perfect sacrifice on the cross. My friends, that cross is Jesus' greatest act of servanthood, and that cross is your ultimate and my ultimate source of hope. You and I have all the hope in the world because of Jesus. But can we really be sure of that? I mean, can you and I really put all of our eggs in that basket? All of our life and death and eternal life eggs? Can we put our full weight down on Jesus alone? Someone has run a computer model. What they did is they took eight Old Testament prophecies and they ran it through the computer system and came up with the odds that all eight of those Old Testament messianic prophecies could come to fruition in the life of just one singular person. Do you know what the odds are? One in ten to the 28th power. That's a 10 with 28 zeros after it. Now, to give you a sense of just how astronomically unlikely those odds are, if you had a silver dollar for every one of those zeros, you could cover the entire state of Texas with silver dollars. Up to your knees. My friends, there are not eight Old Testament messianic prophecies that came to fruition in the life of Jesus. To be specific, there are 333. So what are the odds? What are the odds that all of those could come to fruition in the life of one single person named Jesus 
of Nazareth. That's why in verse 8, Paul says that when Christ came as servant, he did show did so to show God's truthfulness and to confirm all of the promises made to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc. In other words, in Christ Jesus, all of God's messianic promises come true in spades. You and I can put our full weight down on Jesus. And because of that, you and I have absolutely all the hope in the world. Especially if you're a Jew. In this text, Paul says Christ came to serve the circumcision, the Jews. And so if you're a Jew and you've come to the understanding of who Jesus is as your Messiah and given your life to him, then all of God's promises, the thousands of them in Scripture, are true for you and you have all the hope in the world. But what about the rest of us? Most of us here in the sanctuary this morning are not from Jewish backgrounds. We, we don't have that great spiritual pedigree that they do. We're Gentiles. We're, we're goyim. Are we kind of on the sidelines of God's promises? That was an issue, a live issue in the early church. There was friction, even in the church at Rome, over just who Jesus did come to serve and to save. Even a clash at the top between the Apostle Paul and Peter. Peter said Jesus came only to serve and save Jews. And Paul disagreed with him violently, said no. He came to serve and save Gentiles as well, and they went at it. But who's right? Who won the debate? In matters of theological controversy, the winners are always those who stick with Scripture. In this case, Paul. Paul was right. And he shows us that this morning, if you look at verses 9 through 12 of your text, he addresses the Gentiles there in Rome, and he says, don't worry, look at this. And he piles on four Old Testament references, four Old Testament prophecies, two from the Psalms, one verse from Deuteronomy, another from Isaiah, where he says Christ came to serve and save the Gentiles as well. Debate over. Paul nails it here with these scriptures. So if you're sitting here this morning as a Gentile wondering, is this true for me as well? It is. This means that all of the thousands of promises in Scripture are true for you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and therefore you too, just like Jews, have all the hope in the world. Well, Paul ends our text in verse 13 with a prayer for Jew and Gentile alike. Really, it's kind of a benediction. And he talks about the peace and the joy that come when the Holy Spirit regenerates our hearts and gives us faith in Christ, and we are able to believe, and how that ushers in a life that abounds with hope. In 1954, Billy Graham made his first visit to Great Britain, and Churchill wanted to meet with him. And so a meeting was arranged between the two men at the Prime Minister's residence there at 10 Downing Street. And when Billy Graham walked into the room, Sir Winston cut right to the chase. The first words he said to Graham were, young man, do you have any hope? That's the question. It's every week. It's unuttered, but that's the question you're asking of me every time I step into this pulpit. Ron, do you have any hope for us? Well, my answer for you today and on any Sunday, of course, is yes, as long as I stay with the Scriptures. My friends, the Bible is absolutely a gold mine of hope, and we are in one of the richest veins this morning. When you and I look around us, and we see the darkness of life, even the darkness of this presidential election with lying and name-calling and all that kind of stuff, 
This morning, I, I led worship for the Seclovia 5K runners, and as I arrived at Lions Field, the first thing I saw were police officers with bomb-sniffing dogs going over the stage that I would be standing on. That's the new norm of darkness that you and I live in. Bombs going off this past week in New Jersey, in New York. Riots, bloodshed in the streets of our cities. The darkness is all around us. Where do you and I look for hope? We don't look to the White House. We look to God's house. And the one who is the head of God's house, the church, Jesus Christ, who comes with towel and bowl of water to wash yours and my feet, to make us clean, to put his robe of righteousness around us, to serve us that we might have all the hope in the world. You know, we talk a lot around here about making Jesus visible. Well, just what Jesus are you and I to make visible to the world? I believe it's the image we encounter in this text. Jesus as servant. When you and I as individual Christians and we as a congregation, the First Presbyterian Church of San Antonio, when we take the posture of servanthood, even amidst the darkness, and we serve not ourselves but the world, it's then we kindle a spark of hope in those around us who are living in that darkness. Did you know that God's salvation is not his primary goal for your life and mine. Now, if you read the Bible, you discover oh, that's part of it. But his main goal for you and me is that you and I be honed, conformed to the image of his son. So what does his son look like? Well, he looks like a servant. Our salvation is already secured by what Christ did for us. You and I can have peace with God through what Christ did for us as his servant. But now the call is to you and me to abound in hope. And Paul says, when you and I do that, there's a joy. A joy that comes from servanthood. A joy of even planting a tree under which you and I know that we will never sit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.